Uh, hello, everybody. Welcome to Why Did You Read That? My name is Megan. And I'm Peter. That's Peter. <laughs> and we're here to talk about some books with you. That's right. So I have four books, and Peter has four books, and we're both going to pick a couple of the other's books and talk about them. And then we'll talk about the others, too, because we just can't help ourselves. Yep. I got my, my four books in giant font on this because I copied and pasted it, and it was giant. And I just left it that way. I'll let you I'll let you use that as your excuse. Yeah, I'm going to the eye doctor next week. <laughs> I haven't been since like twenty eighteen. It's been a while for me too. I need to go. Yeah. It's uh finally, you know, their emails have gotten more dire as yeah. the years have a little gone. getting a little strident. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> well, before we start talking books, would you like to hear a joke? Yep. Okay. What dog likes to take bubble baths? I don't know. A shampoodle. <laughs> I was trying to think of dog types, and I was like, what sounds like bubble bath? <laughs> but that's good. Shampoodle. That is solid. Yeah, I like it. Okay. I think right. you're first this time. I think you are correct. Hold on. I need <coughs> to get me. out a pen. Oh, you're going to take notes? Maybe. You know, we're in my office, so I can actually offer you a pen. Yeah, we're in a, a different venue. So if this sounds totally off, it's because of a change of venue. Here. I have a holographic a very, pickle yeah. pen. Oh, my God. I know. It's fancy. That was, like, the coolest thing I've ever seen. Yeah, How undo do I... it. It's uh, the little lever. Whoa. Yeah. I, I don't even know how to describe this in words. But... I know. It's like it, it crinkles. Yeah, imagine a pen that's, like, covered in wrapping paper. And you flip a switch and it like crinkles the pen. It's I'm going to have cool. to take a video of this to show my partner because okay. she's real into like. Yeah, you can get pens. them online. It's called Crush Metric. Oh, yeah. Okay. And uh, cool. I double checked. It takes a, a specific type of like ink cartridge from a disposable pen. So on the website, it says like if you get this disposable pen, you can take out the ink and put it in this. So you can oh, keep it. so it's like just a normal pen. Yep. That you can, okay. All there right. Okay. This is, I've never felt so fancy and alive. <laughs> With my holographic crush pen. Yeah. Very nice. I feel very honored, too, that you gave me this pen instead of a crap pen. I like, like to share. I used to, when I worked here at the library and, you know, was like public facing and stuff, I always had two pens on me because <laughs> one was for me and one was for like inevitably when someone asked to borrow one. Yeah. And I'd be like, all right, they can borrow this one, because if I don't get it back, that's not a tragedy. Well, if you were just some rando who popped their head into my office, I wouldn't have given you that pen. <laughs> You'd be like, I'm going to hide this holographic pen like, in my shoe. Here's my junky plastic <laughs> pen that only works half the time. <laughs> all right. So here's what I have. Okay. First off, I have a graphic novel called The Night Eaters by Marjorie Liu and Sana Takeda. Okay. And it is about basically a haunted house across the street. All right. It's um, distinctly Asian flair. Like, I can't tell if it's Chinese, Japanese, or a combination, but it's got that, like, vibe going on. Marjorie Liu did a series. Monstrous. Monstrous. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Which won a lot of awards, if I recall correctly. Okay. The yes. Eisner, I think. That was a pretty popular one. Yeah. Uh, next up, I have Audienceology by Kevin Getz. And Kevin Getz is um, like the guy in Hollywood who test does test marketing for films. Oh. So like um, they bring in audiences to see rough cuts of films and he diagnoses what's wrong with them for the studios and the directors and all of that. So he's the kind of person who's to blame for the Snyder Cut fiasco. And similar. <laughs> I'm not sure that you could lay that at his feet, but he, he doesn't tell people what to do. He basically shows films to audiences and talks about where they didn't land with the audience. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. So like they got confused at this part or this, fe um, they felt like it ran too long or, um, I don't know. He has lots of anecdotes and stuff about, about that kind of thing. Cool. Yeah. Then I have a book called Hyde by Kirsten White. And it is a horror novel about this group of, I think it's 12 people who get brought to this abandoned amusement park in the middle of nowhere. And they're told that they're playing a 
game of extreme hide and seek. Uh. And two people get eliminated every day, and the person, the last one standing, gets fifty thousand um, dollars. But it it isn't necessarily people who are looking for them. <laughs> mm. mm-hmm. So. Yeah, when they use words like eliminated in yeah. these situations, you're like, what does that the mean? The people who are eliminated just don't ever come back. Right. Yeah. You yeah. See eliminated again. from being alive. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just rented a hard target from the library. Yeah. The Jean-Claude Van Damme, John Woo movie. Yeah, I don't where, know it, so. Well, it's one of the many films where it's like, what is the deadliest prey of all? Mm. Man. Yeah. Specifically Jean-Claude Van Damme. Sure. He can somehow do the splits and that will help him not get killed. <laughs> okay. If you say so. And he plays a character named Chance Boudreaux. Of course he does. <laughs> because that is definitely like a an of that era action hero name. Yeah. They have names that like when you're in the movie, you don't think about it. But then like you're watching, uh, what is it, Total Recall? And then you're like, John Matrix? Has anyone ever been named Matrix no. ever? Yeah, that's not a real thing. And his his buddy Steve Calculus. Like <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. All right. Uh and then my fourth book is Bird Planet by Tim Lehman. And this one is mostly just really pretty pictures of birds, but it also has some essays about how he found the birds and it's birds from like all of the continents including Antarctica. He's uh done work for like National Geographic and a bunch of documentaries and stuff. And uh, he also writes about, um, like, ecology and conservation and how the health of the planet's birds reflect the health of the planet overall. And so if you work towards bird conservation, you're, like, also saving the environment. Okay. I was like, we have to look back over the last year, because I think you've had a bird book, like, almost every time. Leave have you alone. made a, Have you made, like, a book list of bird books no, I just like birds, okay? No, I know, but I'm saying you should make one. It would be weird and offbeat, but I think that's its appeal, right? Yeah. And the people who are into it would be super into it. I can make like a fine feathered friends book list. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. I can do that. I think we should just start like a, a you know, a summer reading, but it's just bird books. <laughs> a program for just for reading bird books. I think that we should do this with everybody and everybody has to make their random obsession book list. That's a great idea. And then you can just have bookmarks with, like, everyone's weird random obsession. Look forward, everyone, to our next newsletter when it's My Random Obsession, a book list. And the first one will be by Megan. And it's going to be about <laughs> birds. <laughs> I could do birds or polar exploration, I'll have you know. Polar expo- exploration is not a weird... That's an amazing hobby to get into. No, it's not a hobby. It's an interest. I don't. I don't want to go and well, do yeah, polar exploration. That was a poor choice of words. Because <laughs> yeah, I don't either. I've read too much about it to want to actually do it. I was gonna say if you've read any one of many books about it, I think that would persuade most people. Yeah, it's a special person who wants to actually do it. Yeah, I don't think it's a coincidence that polar exploration ended about the time that books became like mass marketable and like <laughs> available to the general public and then they're like wait what what happened yeah <laughs> Forget no, thank you. This. yeah yeah do you want to be shipwrecked and stuck in the ice and not move for 18 months yeah. get scurvy and potentially have to eat your your shipmates yeah yep. there's there's nothing up there you know i don't know if you know there's nothing there's nothing <laughs> okay well I definitely, I want to hear about audienceology. Okay. Because that sounds like kind of a niche nonfiction. It is. And those are always interesting. And I do like books about movies, sometimes more than I like movies. So. Yeah. Okay. So um, it's, it's a little bit, it's got elements of memoir. And then it's also kind of him talking about his area of expertise. And uh, he, and also how, like how he got into it. So he starts out talking about how he grew up always wanting to, to act. He wanted to be an actor. And he lived in New York. So he, w- he was like, I'm going to be on Broadway. I'm going to be in commercials. And his parents were like not into it. They were like, that sounds like a lot of work for us. And you know, thank you. <laughs> kind of seems like what the standard operating procedure of parents yep, yep. is like. Are you sure you don't want to do something that like, you know, 
we won't have to support you financially. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, they finally gave in because one day he took a bus into Manhattan and uh, paid for his own headshots and like went to a dance class and all of that. And they were like, all right, so you're serious about this. So we'll go ahead and get you an agent. <laughs> Okay, fine. <laughs> yeah. And so he made it like some commercials and um, did some theater and stuff like that. And he became a working actor and um, eventually moved to California to try like movies and television. And he continued to do stage plays. And uh, But he also had like an entrepreneurial spirit. Like he'd started up businesses like from the time he was a youth like when he was in high school i think he started a business hmm. i can't remember what it was but it was like he had insurance like it was an honest to god business wow <laughs> yeah so he started feeling like he wanted to try something new and um was kind of examining his future and he got a part-time job with this company where he basically it was this company that did film screenings. And so he had like a clipboard and he would wander through and like identify people of a certain demographic that they could pull after to do like the more in-depth, like um, round table, like the panel. Mm -hmm. And they could talk to a bit more. And he felt like he was using both his entrepreneurial like business mind and his artistic mind because he, he felt like he was acting, you know, he was... I always said, like, really good customer service is a little bit of acting. Sure, yeah. Yeah, and so he felt like he was doing he was doing that with the interacting with everybody and getting them to open up. And also, there it was, like, the business side of the movies. And so he ended up, um, after, he ended up, like, advancing in that company and became, like, a pretty higher-up, well-known name. And then that company got bought by somebody else, and he ended up eventually going off on his own and starting his own film screening company. Okay. So now he's like the guy. Like everyone wants specifically him. I guess a bunch of people followed him to his new company to the point where his old company sued him. <laughs> <laughs> but he hadn't signed a non-compete clause. So, ah, so he was there fine. There you go. But um, so yeah, he basically – people contact him and he – very quickly has to arrange for these screenings. And it's like, so he has like a theater and then he has to figure out who, who to, how to, how to get his audience. Cause they used to do it. They would just like go, go on the just radio random, and say like, yeah. Hey, if you want to see a movie for free, that's, you know, not out yet, come to this theater. And then whoever showed up, showed up. Right. Then and my grandma is watching Terminator Salvation, exactly. having never seen a Terminator <laughs> exactly. before. And it's just like, I don't know what is going on. <laughs> like, I'm not the target audience for this movie. Right. <laughs> yeah. So he's trying to get like a, like a good representation of a movie going audience, focusing on like who's actually going to go, like who, who's, who are they targeting? Right. And so he gets all of those people in. It's like a rough cut of the movie, so there's no sound. Um, the music isn't final music. It's it's like all rough stuff. Mm -hmm. And they show the movie to everybody, and then they all fill out like a comment card, and then they pull the people you know that are that are kind of like more what they're targeting to do a more in depth interview. Okay. In like a group. And he takes all of the information he gets from them, translates it in his, in his brain, because he says that it's like a very sensitive subject, like directors mm. and filmmakers and actors can take it super personally <laughs> when you tell them, you know, what didn't work with an audience. Okay, so this lady said your movie sucks. Yeah. I know you put your heart out there and did, you know, this thing close to your soul and it's terrible. Yeah. He said he's seen people punch walls. He's seen people vomit. He's seen people cry. <laughs> Do you think you would be more likely to get such horrible feedback that you would punch a wall or vomit? I don't know. I think I'd be a crier. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the vomiting person, it was before the film was shown. So it was nerves. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, I guess it's like a really scary thing. And a lot of the blurbs on the book are from filmmakers who are like, you know, this it's one of the scariest things that I have to do in my job and I feel a little less scared when he's in the room. Like 
Yeah, I so. mean, it would be kind of terrible, especially, like, the first time. Yeah. Or if you're, like, you know how they have, like, a lot of indie filmmakers who then mm-hmm. they make a thing or two, and then all of a sudden they're making, like, a Doctor Strange sequel or something, right. and then you're like, oh, no. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> like, somebody gave me $40 million to make this movie. He actually talks a little bit about the, the studio versus indie filmmakers, because a lot of... The, the studio filmmakers, they have a research department, and the research department right. contacts him and says, we're ready for a screening. But there, he gets in touch, he gets contacted by independent filmmakers a lot when they have made a movie and they're looking for a distributor. Uh, um, and they're ho- they want to do a screening in the hopes that they'll get, you know, a lot of feedback that will help them find a distributor. Yeah. But they pay for the screening on their own because they're indie. Oh, interesting. Which, yeah, I thought was an interesting tidbit. Things I'd never thought about before. So like the indie ones, it's more about like how do I sell this movie, mm-hmm. and the uh, the bigger one is more. Well, it's like... also about improving the movie, hopefully. Okay. I like yeah. it. And he's he goes around and he interviews people from back in the day uh-huh. about what it used to be like, because uh, they used to it used to not matter so much that they did it kind of fast and loose because they used to open theaters or they used to open movies in like. A couple dozen theaters and then oh, it would sure. like expand out and yeah. they they used to not be so expensive but now right. you have you know movies opening nationwide in hundreds of theaters right. you have tons of cg that they need to pay for like things are expensive now and once it got expensive they were like we should make sure that this is gonna work before we <laughs> before we send it out Okay. So now now it's more mainstream. A lot of times people wouldn't even do it or they would do it oh, kind of like, yeah. like slapdash. Right. Um, but now it's like a big business. It's like a thing that's part of the process. That makes sense. Yeah. And he talks about one of the movies that made the difference was Jaws, which he I didn't work on. I was going to ask if he names movies and names He does, and, and he stuff. has anecdotes about specific okay. movies and, and talks about specific changes that came out, which I thought I think is really interesting. Yeah. Like, when they showed Jaws, um, I guess it was Steven Spielberg's, like, second real movie that he yeah. made. And the first one was kind of like a meh. Like, it, it did it fine, that... but it didn't do great. It's wasn't like it the like Sugarland a... Express, I think. Yeah. yeah. So they were nervous because it was, like, going to be a big release. Yeah. And they showed it to the to the theater. And I guess, um, because if you know anything about the making of Jaws, I guess the shark half the time didn't work. And when it did work, yeah. it looked so fake that everyone was, like, laughing at it. Yep. So they were pretty worried, you know, if this was going to work. Yeah. And then they showed, they did the screening and they got some screams and they were like, oh, good. This is going to work, you know, <laughs> um, to the point where that famous line, we're going to need a bigger boat. Yeah. Um, the audience at the screening didn't hear it because they were still like, like freaking out <laughs> from the appearance of the shark. I guess the good thing is like at that time, I suppose it's not like unless you I don't know, you'd been to an aquarium or something. Like, yeah. I wouldn't have had a whole lot of familiarity True. with a shark. But yeah, it seems like those animatronics never work yeah. in movies. They're always like, ooh, we made this awesome animatronic. And then it's like, it broke on the second day. Yeah. We could never make the eyes work. So there was some guy standing behind it, like, manually. Yep. <laughs> but they uh, they ended up making a change because of the screening of Jaws. Um, do you know the scene where Richard Dreyfus is... Um is diving they're looking for there's like a shipwreck that would they think was a shark attack and they're looking for evidence yeah and then like the the head pops out of the boat yeah so they got like the audience jumped at that part but um they had a feeling that they could do better so they went back and they refilmed that whole scene in steven spielberg's like accountant's pool <laughs> <laughs> which I, i'm like I'm, this is fascinating to me and uh, so they waited until it was getting dark, and then they dumped a gallon of water in the pool to make it look a little murky. Uh-huh. Or no, a gallon of milk, sorry. Ugh. They dumped a gallon of milk in the pool so it looked a bit murky. And they, instead of just having the head, like, in the boat when he, like, goes by it, they had, like, the hole in the boat, and Richard Dreyfus sh- shines his light in, and it's empty, and then the head, like, bobs out. Uh-huh. And that that's the change that they made, and then they got screams at the second <laughs> screening. So just little anecdotes like that. Can you imagine too, like, I always think about these side characters, like you're Steven Spielberg's accountant. Yeah. And he's like, 
do you think we could use your pool for this thing? And I'd just be like, oh, my God. I, I had no idea that being... I'm going to put a big boat in the bottom and then dump a gallon of milk in there. Yeah. <laughs> It'll in like a fake corpse, and then this guy is going to be swimming around in it, yeah. and you're just like Ugh. we'll have a bunch of people with cameras like walking across your lawn and muddy and everything up. Yeah. <laughs> now, like a decade later, you could be like, they filmed part of Jaws in my yeah. pool. That yeah. would be like a selling point. But at that time, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she must have had some sense that he was going to make it big. Must have been. Yeah, I guess if you're someone's accountant and you're like. I think this guy's going to be like a multimillionaire. Yeah. And maybe he'll keep using me for his taxes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, how could you not? Yeah. At that point, it would have to be like, they would have to do some pretty horrible fraud for yeah. me to like move on to You'd a get new get at account. least a few more years. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, if they even discussed going away, I'd be like, I believed in you. <laughs> yeah. Did you know that they bought the rights to Jaws before it was even published? No. It was a first book. I had no idea. Yeah. So they were pretty nervous about it. Yeah. But then the book was like runaway bestseller. Yeah. So they put out their uh, their call for an audience and it was like raining like crazy. So they were afraid no one would come. 300 people had to be turned away. Wow. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Success. Yep. Huge successful movie. So yeah. It's just basically a lot of like information about the inner workings of Hollywood and anecdotes about movies and how movies become what they are i love that stuff yeah i think you'd probably like it all right he made a bet with the guy who made forrest gump that it wasn't gonna be a huge that it wouldn't like break a certain dollar amount at the box office and lost (laughs) (laughs) said it's his biggest embarrassment (laughs) is the is losing that bet that one is like a weird yeah it goes like back and forth i think because it was like a huge hit and then I think it had like a reevaluation, and yeah. people were like, eh, this is nonsense. And But then it's, I don't know. It, it is nonsense, keeps... but it's like feel good nonsense. So, yeah, I think it's like a movie where when you describe it, or like if you try to describe the plot of it, you're like, yeah. this is the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my yeah. life. But when you're watching it, you're like, eh, it works somehow. Yeah. It's weird. Yeah. Those kinds of movies that hit you in the feels and are like well made, I think will always. Yeah last yeah very watchable yeah so yeah that's audienceology all right i recommend it it's interesting by some guy named kevin kevin gets and he's like the the top guy he's the one that everyone wants in hollywood to do this he's a get he's a get is a get he's one of the gets boom (laughs) kevin if you're out there feel free to use that as a blurb (laughs) i'm sure he will (laughs) uh test it with some audiences see what they think (laughs) I think they're going to love it. Okay. Well, I've got my four books here. I'm ready. Um, Three of my four books are kind of like kids' books. Okay. I would say like fifth grade boys would really like them. That's all right. Um, I'm down for that. I don't know how this happened. It just sort of happened. Yeah. So the first one is called The Day My Butt Went Psycho by Andy Griffiths. (laughs) (laughs) Andy Griffiths, like... The Andy Griffiths? Nope. Okay. Not like the da 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 Right. Da, no, different one. Okay. He's got an S on the end. Oh, okay. And is some other guy. All right. Who wrote the Butt Trilogy. So not Opie's dad. <laughs> no. Okay. Fair enough. Um, The Day My Butt Went Psycho is in brief about a boy whose uh, butt jumps oh, off his body oh. and, yeah, leads a revolution of butts. Okay. Um, and this is a thing that happens occasionally is people's butts jump off their bodies and the butt catcher has to bring them <laughs> back. But uh, this time things get like way out of hand. I can say without having read it that this is definitely one of those books you could give to a nephew at Christmas and it would be a big hit. A hundred percent. Yeah. <laughs> if, I had, if I was reading this when I was 10, I would be dying laughing. Yeah. Every, every like five pages, I'd be like, this is the funniest thing ever. How did this exist? I am unsurprised. <laughs> um, the next one is Rowley Jefferson's Awesome Friendly Spooky Stories by Jeff Kinney. Okay. So that's a Diary of a Wimpy Kid guy. What's the, say the title again. Rowley Jefferson's Awesome Friendly Spooky Stories. Okay. It's like kind of a spin-off of Diary of a Wimpy Kid is the Rowley Jefferson okay. series. 
And this is a book of very short sort of scary in quotation mark stories. Mm -hmm. Um, I read sort of Halloween time uh, and was very amused. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Um, The next one is called Your Pal Fred by Michael Rex. Um, The way I describe this one is it's about like a doll who is sort of the reverse of Chucky. He's like a friendly doll. And he's thrown into a sort of Mad Max scenario. Okay. (laughs) And uh, that's the basic premise there. The last one is like a book for grownups. Okay. Uh, It's called Resident Alien by Peter Hogan. Uh, It's a graphic novel. It's about an alien who crash lands on Earth. Okay. And then uh, he can kind of disguise himself for most people, and he's disguising himself as like a retired doctor living in a very rural area. But then something happens in the community that forces him to get more involved, and he kind of... It's kind of like Murder, She Wrote, where it's like he sort of starts to like solving these mysteries because I think he's really bored. (laughs) Waiting for someone to come rescue right. him. So it's kind of like a, a quaint, it's it's almost a cozy mystery, not quite. It's like probably a little too violent for that, but okay. not by a lot. Okay. All right. Where to start? Let's start with Rally Jefferson's awesome, friendly, spooky stories. Okay. So I picked this one up because it was like short spooky stories for Halloween and I was like oh, I could probably read this in like a half hour and uh, I read a couple of those Diary of Wimpy Kid books and I think they're very charming mm-hmm. and uh, you know it was always my pet peeve that parents would come in and be like all my son wants to read is Diary of a Wimpy Kid Right. He'll, that's all he'll read which I'm like that's fine Yeah. He'll I be mean fine. if they're reading for pleasure you're winning yes yeah if they're choosing to read I Whatever they're choosing to read is great. Also, I think they have this nice quality because it's like the drawings are simple and the writing is pretty simple. Yeah. And so I think it would encourage kids to like make their own version of it. Yeah. It's not like daunting. It's not like I'm reading, uh, I don't know. I don't know what people want kids to read, Huckleberry Finn or something. Right. And I'm like, "I, I don't know anything about this. Or like Call of the Wild. Yeah. And I'm like... I grew up in the suburbs. I don't know about, like, starting a fire and wolves and whatever. (laughs) So anyway, this has, like, a bunch of little stories that are probably, like, four or five pages long each. Uh, And there's a bunch of super goofy ones. I'll just share a couple of my favorites. Okay. There's there's one about a guy. He's, like, a, a middle schooler. And he's born just a head. He has no body. He's just a head. And then he happens to go to middle school with the Headless Horseman, who's also in middle school. Okay. So they become friends. Obviously. And then they, the dance is coming up at the school. And so everybody's paired up for the dance, and they were just going to stay at home or whatever. But then a new girl comes to the school, and they both like her. So they're like, they come up with the idea to team up, you know, so he'll be the head on the Headless Horseman's Uh body, and then they could take her to the dance. (laughs) A match made in heaven. Yep. And then, you know, (laughs) things take a turn because, you know, one of them likes more than the other and so on and so forth. But it's hilarious. Okay. And the drawings are, like, absolutely absurd Mm -hmm. because it's just, like, this head, you know, is, like, sitting on the floor or sitting on a table or whatever. (laughs) And he doesn't get into any details about, like, you know. How did he get up on the table? How is he alive? What is happening? You know, it's just like, eh. You know, and eventually he's an adult just ahead with a mustache. <laughs> I'm glad to hear he can grow facial hair. Yeah, apparently. Shaving is going to be difficult. I, impossible, yeah, I would yeah. argue. <laughs> I think the uh, the other one I really liked, I don't know why, it was so weird and I was like, would kids find this funny? I don't know. Okay, it's a story about there's a mummy and he's like a, you know... A uh, mummy that was taken from Egypt and put in a museum, and so he wakes up and he's really angry. So he goes on a rampage, you know, and it's like a a, a minor rampage. 
but, you know, he's an unstoppable mummy or whatever. Right. And then he, you know, just gets sort of tired of rampaging and, like, lives in an apartment. <laughs> he works out of his temper tantrum. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like, it's mostly like he runs out of steam. Right. Like, he's still mad, but he's just like, who has the energy to, like, do anything? Then a second mummy is discovered. But this mummy is, like, really nice and friendly, and, like, everybody loves this mummy. And, you know, the first mummy was, like, not very uh, well-preserved, uh, so his bandages are all falling off and stuff, and this mummy looks really tidy, this new mummy. And so he starts to become, like, a celebrity, and is, you know, trademarks the name The Mummy. <laughs> and so then, you know, this other mummy is trying to, like, get in on the action and, like branding himself as a mummy <laughs> and like <laughs> there's i think three or four copyright lawsuits in this story you know between in a children's book <laughs> yeah between these two mummies who are like arguing over who gets to call themselves the mummy and is a mummy should close enough or like <laughs> who is the original mummy that's like what i think the first one does he calls himself like the real original mummy or something <laughs> like so anyway, um, those are my two favorites, but okay. there are several other stories like along these lines, yeah. which I'm just like, these are just totally bonkers and like, like spooky adjacent, but mostly silly. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I can't imagine anyone actually being afraid of any of this. And it's also, it was just fun as an adult to read too. Cause yeah. you're just sort of like, this is just so wacky. Yeah. Like it, it makes no sense, but doesn't attempt to at any point there's something fun about you know not worrying about if it makes sense yeah it's kind of it. yeah it reminds me of like maybe some episodes of the simpsons mm -hmm. where you're like they just hit the gas and it's like if you stop to think about it you'd be like this makes no sense right but they're just like purposely saying like look if you want a thing that makes sense you're gonna have to look somewhere else because right. this is about this yeah, yeah. <laughs> um <laughs> So anyway, I would say it was it was like a, a pleasure to read. Yeah. And would highly recommend it. And like you said, too, about the other one, like if you have like a, a nephew or a niece who's like, a, you know, I don't know, between first and fifth grade, I think they would love this. Cool. Yeah. This is the time of year where people who have kids in their lives but don't necessarily know what they're interested in are looking for Yeah. ideas. So. And if you were a parent cool who was like, I have to read, you know, I'm reading to my kids before they go to sleep. I right. was like, I have to read. <laughs> <laughs> I have this horrible thing I have to do. Um, if you read to your kids before bedtime, this might be a book that like, you wouldn't hate reading. Yeah. Um, so that's another plus. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I've been thinking about potentially revisiting the Babysitter's Club, the original Babysitter's Club books. <laughs> <laughs> because I haven't read them since I was but a wee thing. Yeah. And I'm like, I wonder what they read like as an adult. And like, will I get the nostalgia hit out of them that I think I will? You know, I reread a Goosebumps book a couple years ago. Yeah. Because it had been, yeah, since I was in third grade or something. And it was weird because I was like, I had no memory of it. Yeah. And then it was sort of just like, there was a haunted house. And it's like, yeah, that was real haunted. <laughs> the end you know <laughs> i don't know i have i don't know that i'd call it vivid memories of one of the babysitter's club books but i will say that the i think it's the second one made a distinct impact on my brain because hmm. uh, it was about one of the babysitter's club girls is babysitting and she keeps getting these hang-up phone calls Ooh. and they're scaring her and I remember being so terrified by the thought of this. And it turns out to be something completely benign. Like, you know, I don't even remember what, but it was something where I was like, and everything was fine, which is what you need when you're that age. But now sure. I would be hoping for like, you know, the colors coming inside from the inside house. the house. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it, it, it jump started my horror loving little brain. Hmm. Um, Cause I remember reading it and being like, this is so scary. Yeah, I, I'd never thought of, I guess, you know, they weren't marketed to me, but just like remembering the covers and stuff, I wouldn't have thought of Babysitter's Clubs yeah. as like getting into that sort of thing. Yeah, they went into a lot of stuff. Like, I think one of the babysitters has diabetes, and so they talked about that, and 
one comes from like one's parents are getting divorced. So they hit on a, a lot of stuff. And as a babysitter, you know, the idea is that you're in charge of things. And so it talks about responsibility and some of the scary parts of it. Like, you know, what happens if you're home and you're responsible for these kids and mm. someone keeps calling and hanging up? <laughs> what do you do? Yeah. <laughs> Go get a knife. Yeah. <laughs> no, probably not. I'm guessing they had a better suggestion than that. Yeah, I need to reread it because, like I said, it made an impact, but I don't really remember it. That's what they always do in the horror movie. They, like, run to the kitchen and get a big knife. Yeah. And you're just like, you know what? I would suggest get the second best knife in the kitchen because you're going to lose that one immediately somehow. <laughs> Based on every movie I've seen, you're going to lose that knife. So then you still have the best one available. Well, and you should also pay attention to which knife you're grabbing because, you know, they're not meant for stabbing. Yeah, so you're, true. So you're inevitably going to, like, cut yourself on it yeah. if, you're, if you're stabbing something. It's not going to work. So. It's not a good idea. Careful. Yeah. Think, ab- think, think about it. Think about your safety first, everyone. Yeah. Think twice. Grab a knife. <laughs> <laughs> Don't take our advice. Our advice no, is yeah. terrible. Yeah. If, if you're a babysitter getting calls from inside the house. Just leave the house. Probably just leave. Yeah. Yeah. Just go ahead and leave. Well, and everyone has cell phones now, so it's less dire. That's true. Yeah, I guess. Does that work anymore? Like the calls coming from inside the house? Because it's like, well, I guess that was never impossible to begin with on a cell phone, right? Right. Yeah. You wouldn't be like, oh, my word. It's coming from your location. Yeah. It's like, (laughs) oh, did my mom lose the remote again? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I'm getting text messages from inside the house. Yep. They keep telling me to take out the garbage. Yeah, now the scary part is I'm getting phone calls on my cell phone. Right, yeah. Why aren't they texting me? Ah. Oh my gosh, this is the day after uh, the election. Yeah. I'm so glad that I'm done getting texts. I didn't get any. I got so many this year. Yeah, I don't know. I didn't even know some of the candidates going in until, but I was getting so many texts that I was starting to be able to put together who was running against who. <laughs> yeah. Because I was like, okay, well, this person really doesn't like this other person. Yeah, I'm I'm really excited because I, I don't have cable or like broadcast TV, but I do stream stuff and I have some stuff that comes with commercials and ads and stuff. Yeah. And I'm really looking forward to not seeing any more election ads. Yeah. They're just, they're just terrible. They are pretty, uh, they seem poorly researched, I guess. And well, like, just I weird. Mean, they're, they have a, a specific aim in mind and it's to get you to vote based on your emotions. And so they're poking at your emotions. And I, my response is, you don't know me. Yeah. I just didn't like. <laughs> Do my I, own research. Thank you. Yeah. I just don't like how it, it would be like if we did this podcast, but we just were like, okay, I wanted to promote you know, Rally Jefferson or whatever. So the way I did that was talking about a similar book and how much I hated it. Yeah. And like, this is terrible. This is going to ruin your family. Your child will never be the same. Yeah. You they know? will never pick up another book ever. <laughs> yeah. So if you have two brain cells to rub together, you'll pick up this book instead. Yeah. It's like, oh, that seems a little extreme. Yeah. It's like, I mean, you could just tell me what your what your plans are. And yeah. I, I'll make a choice. Yeah. I'd prefer that. <laughs> yeah, it'd be nice. They should take our example. I don't know why they haven't yet. I don't Been doing either. this long enough. If, if only everyone was more like us. I know. It would be so much easier. So much easier. <laughs> <laughs> All right, hit me with a second book. Oh, man. I think I want to hear about Hyde. Hyde? Yeah. Yeah, it seems like the kind of thing you might get into. I mean, when you were saying abandoned amusement park, yeah. I was like, I'm 70% in already. Well, in the end papers of the book, like when you open the cover and you see the, you know, the, the where it's like off in blue or something. Yeah, yeah. This has a map of uh, the old um, amusement park. Do you like a map? It's, yeah, and it's like a fun map. It's like uh, if you went to an amusement park and you opened it and it has like scribbled notes on it and stuff. Nice. So the the whole idea behind this amusement park, which is called like Amazement Land or something like that, um, is that when it was opened, people like immediately got lost in it. Like it's all winding paths and tons of vegetation. And so people went in and they just like they they were never able to it felt like make it to like I'm 
it's not like a place where you're like, I want to go on the roller coaster and you go to the roller coaster. You just like end up getting swallowed by the park and find things and, and go on those rides. And then at the end of the day, they turn on these big like spotlights at the entrance and everyone kind of stumbles out like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, there, there's this house at the center of the park that almost no one ever makes it to. And uh, there's a sign on it that it's under renovation and it's never, ever open. Uh-huh. So, you know, these, these are, this is just details that we're given as the reader. And one day, um, there, this family comes into the amusement park and when they leave at the end of the day, their daughter, their fi- I think she's five or something, um, is missing. And they never are able to find her in the amusement park and that's why they close down. Uh. So it's like closed down and decrepit for a ton of years. And then you get into like the actual book. That's like the, the prequel or the, the preface. And then you get into the actual book. The main character that, that you spend most of your time with is, uh, her name is Mac McKenzie. And she is in a difficult place in her life. Um, you get the impression pretty quickly that she survived something horrible with an abusive parent who may have done something terrible to the family. And, uh, so she's living in um, a homeless shelter, and she's really great at not being noticed. And she gets called into the, um, I don't know, the head of the of the homeless shelter, mm-hmm. calls her in to talk to her about something and says, we got this flyer about this competition. It's hide and go seek. And uh, the winner gets 50000 And I thought of you, and I thought you could use it. And so I'm telling you about it. And she's like... No, no, thank you. I don't want people to notice me. But when she gets back out onto the floor of the the homeless shelter, they have, like, the morning is over. And if you aren't out, you know, by a certain time, like, you can't leave your stuff anywhere. So all of her stuff has been tossed. Uh, even though she wasn't allowed to bring it into this meeting. Uh, so it almost feels like a setup to me. Yeah. But. So she's like, well, <laughs> at this point, <laughs> well, I don't really shoot. have a choice. <laughs> Fifty thousand dollars would yeah. go away to replacing yeah the few things that I own yeah so she decides she's going to do it and uh, at this point it cuts to like everyone's on a bus all of the contestants are on a bus they introduce you slowly to all of the different contestants all of them are at least partially kind of down on their luck or trying to make something you know you get the she has nicknames for everybody, like um, Beautiful Ava, who is, there are two Avas, and one of them is like a war vet, and the other one is like an aspiring actress. Mm. And then you get um, Toothpaste Commercial, <laughs> who's like a salesman. And, uh-huh. um, so you get to know everybody, and she, but she's trying to like stay disconnected and stay unnoticed, because that's kind of the point of this whole competition. And they get to the... They get to the amusement park and you get a sense that not everything is as it seems. You know, you, everyone falls asleep on the bus mm. and they start to wonder, like, they all drank a bottle of water right before. And they're like, did they drug us? Yeah. And they get to the base camp out, like, at the near the entrance of the amusement park. And the woman who's, like, their handler or whatever, the one who's, like, reading them all the rules and telling them where the bathrooms are and all that stuff... The day, like, when they're about to go on their first day of hiding, she's, like, getting teary-eyed and stuff. Uh-huh. And uh, so, yeah, then you go into, the, you, you get to see some of the park, and it's, like, good and creepy. It's, like, real overgrown and, like, clown statues with their faces, like, of coming off from the weather. And, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so you find a good hiding spot, and, and you know, so you're you're mostly in Mac's point of view, and she will hear like what sounds like footsteps, not quite like it, like a person's bipedal footsteps, uh-huh. but also like they're snuffling and like there's a noise and you start to be like, what is looking for them? And uh, the first day you get, so you get one of the, the business minded ones who like left her hiding spot to go and tell them why this show wasn't ever going to work. Cause they say they're testing it out for like a reality show. Oh, uh, okay. And she's like, I have to go to the bathroom and this is boring and I'm going to go tell them why this show won't work. And by the evening you find out she's out. Right. And then this other guy, he hides in like a clown's mouth, which sounds like <laughs> a terrible idea. It's like a doorway and falls asleep and starts snoring. And he's also out. 
<laughs> and they don't, like, their stuff is gone. No one ever sees them again. They're assuming they just got, like, whisked away at home. Right. But as the reader, you're like, yeah, no, they didn't go home. I don't think so. Yeah. <laughs> so so that's basically, like, and uh, the, also the, the showrunner, the woman who got teary, she tells them that if they can find a small leather-bound book in the park and bring it to her, there's, like, a bonus. But she won't say what the bonus is. <laughs> So, you know, you get the sense that there's definitely something going on in this park. And, like, the townspeople are all a little bit odd in the, like, attached town. It's for, for a defunct park that's no longer open. They, they're all still open and, like, the town is really well preserved. So you're like, what What's is going this? on here? Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, it's creepy and scary and atmospheric. And you get the sense that there's something maybe not natural happening in the park and my kind of read especially this time of year i was uh listening to a a show and a writer was talking about like a way to build sympathy Mm -hmm. and you know he was like a way to build sympathy with a character is like if you the reader uh see them as like oh you poor fool yeah and you know the example he used was like gone with the wind because the book starts out with the lady being like there's not going to be any war (laughs) and you're like oh you poor sweet sweet fool summer child yeah (laughs) that's kind of how i feel about these characters you know because you're like i have seen the Jean-Claude Van Damme movie, Hard Target. You know, I have seen <laughs> and read The Hunger Games. You know, right. I've seen Battle Royale. And you're like, are you not familiar with yeah. <laughs> how these things tend to go? Well, and I, yeah. <laughs> you, you, they, they say, like, this wouldn't make a very interesting reality show because we're all just, you know, finding a spot in a roof somewhere and lying down and un- hoping not to move or make a sound for... From sun up to sundown. Right. And you're right. That's not interesting to watch. Right. So well, how does this make sense? They're going to give you $50,000 yeah. to lie on a roof unmoving for the entire day. Maybe something else is happening yeah. here. Something's <laughs> amiss. So yeah, it's a fun read and it's not very long. Um, it like packs a, a good heavy punch in a short number of pages. So Nice. Yeah. I've always like, so I keep this like... Uh, list of ideas if I ever became an eccentric millionaire. Yeah. Well, if I became a millionaire in order you, to be eccentric. Right. I was like, you are you got the eccentric part already. Yeah. Um, it's because, like, I don't want to become a millionaire. It seems like the richest people in the world don't do anything eccentric. Yeah. So I would... Another one I need to add to the list is, like, buy an, ami- uh, an amusement park and, like, start it and then immediately just let it become dilapidated. Like, I mean... You could always just buy Lakeside and give it a year. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah. Poor Lakeside. 18 months with no pain on that place, I think, would probably just yeah. about do it. Yeah. <laughs> I used to go there once a year for, like, an event. You know, it was, yeah. like, a nighttime event or whatever. And I'd always ride the train. And then you get on the far side of the, the lake, and you're, like, basically in the Walmart loading bay. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> You're like, hey, this isn't as magical as being at, yeah. like, Disney World or something. They need to put up, like, some murals or something to block the view. Even some plywood would yeah. be an improvement. Yeah. Because <laughs> you're just like, I'm basically behind a Walmart right now. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, poor choo Lakeside. Choo-choo. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Well... I kind of want to hear about all of them, but I think I'm going to pick Resident Alien. Okay. So, and I gather at some point this was a a TV show. I don't know if it has the same name on sci-fi, maybe? Okay, well, I haven't seen it, so we'll have to look that up later. I only know this because on the front of the one I was reading, it was like, now a TV series or like the basis for the series or something. So it came first. Yes. I'm going to look it up real fast. I've got my computer. Okay. It could be not out yet, too. I don't know. Started in 2021. Okay. And there's a question online, will there be a third season? And they say, yes, Sci-Fi's picked it up for a third season. Boom. Okay. So our our hero in this story is an alien who has crash-landed on Earth some time ago, like a few years ago. And, uh, yeah, he 
So he has alien powers. Uh, he can like sort of manipulate people's perception okay. in a, a mass way. And, you know, so when he left his planet, they were kind of like, you know, maybe one person in a hundred thousand will look at you and see you as you actually appear. Okay. Um, but everyone else will see kind of what you want them to see. Okay. So he doesn't have to like put on makeup or anything. Nope. Okay. He just kind of like hangs out. And so in the book, he's drawn just as an alien all the time. Okay. Um, and then occasionally people can tell or like they're like, Is this a graphic funky. novel? Or... Yeah. Oh, okay. And they're like, something's kind of funky about this guy or whatever. So he crash landed on earth. He basically had to, um, he, you know, like, broke into a mall, and, like, he has alien technology and stuff, so he got cash from an ATM, and he stole a bunch of clothes and stuff, and then later on sent them money. <laughs> oh, this... so he has a conscience. He does, That's yeah. That's nice. He's totally harmless. Um, and so what he's trying to do is just lay low uh, until an, a fellow alien comes to rescue him, I guess. And so he gets a cabin in a very rural area, and he's just out there and tells everyone he's a retired doctor, and he's kind of known as being a recluse and whatever. So then one night, uh, the sheriff comes and knocks on his door and is like, you were a doctor, right? And he's like, yeah. And he's like, we need your help with something. <laughs> and he's like, Oh, listen, I'm retired. You have to ask Dr. So-and-so. And the sheriff is like, well, that's the problem. Dr. So-and-so has been murdered. And, you know, we need yeah. somebody to, like, give him an autopsy and stuff. And like, Hot tip. If you're trying to lay low, don't be a retired anything useful. Yeah, be something worthless. Yeah. I'm trying to think, like... A typewriter repair person. There you go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, That's a perfect one. You're not going to have an emergency. You'll, you'll have an occasional <laughs> hipster knocking on your door, asking them to fix their Olivetti. Right. And other than that, you'll be fine. <laughs> um, so then he goes into town and he's like investigating. And because he's, you know, an alien and they're more advanced than we are, he can like, he can tell usually when people are lying to him. Okay. Um, he can, he knows things about like human anatomy and stuff. So he can make some inferences and stuff. So he kind of becomes an amateur detective Okay. and is trying to solve the case of, you know, who's, who did this murder and, uh, then another murder happens. So they're like, we have a serial killer on our hands. And so he's been trying to not get involved this whole time, but. Basically, it's kind of a lark for him because he's been so bored, you know, and he's just been kind of like living in his cabin and he likes reading uh, sort of trashy uh, action novels. I don't know what you'd call them. They're like trashy spy novels where they have lots of sex and stuff in them. Right. You know? <laughs> so, um, so throughout the series, the portion that I've read so far, he gets involved in a murder case uh, he gets involved in a second sort of murder case where he's trying to exonerate someone because he's he's sure that that person didn't do it. Right. Uh, but he can't he can't just say I'm an alien. I can tell he's not lying. Trust you know? me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's also a faction of government looking for him because okay. they like discovered this wreckage, and then they're like, "This is kind of weird," and then they have footage from an ATM. Uh -huh. That shows him as an alien. And so, but it's kind of funny too, because they're sort of looking for him, but then they're sort of not looking for him for a while because they start to suspect that this is like, let's say they're the CIA. They think this might be the NSA pulling a <laughs> prank on them because if the CIA comes forward with this, you know, yeah. thing that everyone's like, you fools, then the NSA will get more money for their budget because right. the CIAs will go down, you know, this whole... It's like a whole intergovernmental political thing. Yeah. So there's kind of like that slow burn of like raising the tension though, because they're kind of looking for him, but they're not super urgently looking mm -hmm. for him. So do does he show up as an alien on on like all cameras? Uh, yes. Okay, because so, that's problematic in a modern society. Yes. Yeah, and so that's part of why, too, he'd been so reclusive before. Yeah. And he didn't really go to the city very much or do anything like that, you know. So 
um, yeah, that becomes more and more of a problem for yeah. him as he gets more into the, you know, regular world, I guess you could call it. I mean, he wouldn't be able to communicate with anyone during the lockdown. Right. Yeah, he'd be <laughs> he'd be out of luck. Yeah. Um, he also, like, you know, he enjoys humans. He's not, like, totally emotionless. He's not, like, above humans in that sort of way. He And so he has sort of just missed having other people to talk to and yeah. stuff. So that's part of it. So then, yeah, and he solves kind of a series of, you know semi-quaint mysteries they usually involve a murder but it's also like you know one of the mysteries is he finds out that uh one of the authors one of his favorite authors of these trashy spy books uh was a local resident huh. but nobody knows who it was so he's so trying he wants to... to find out yeah okay so he's trying to figure out who it was you know and it's just just purely for the enjoyment of it yeah <laughs> So these murders, you said they're not quite cozy. So do the murders happen on the page or are they like described graphically? Usually it's like they find a body or something. I guess I would describe it as like, it's not like a gory book or anything like that. There's not like a ton of action, but you know, they'll show like a dead body or something. It's maybe like watching something like, uh, I don't know. I was going to say something like bones, maybe, but, you know, okay. that occasionally shows, like, a body and a bunch of slime or something. <laughs> it's not really like that. It'll just be, like, a dead person on a bed or something. Okay. So it's, like, pretty friendly in that way. I don't know. I felt like it was... This was, like, the comic book reader slash sci-fi fans version of like the mysteries the old lady solves with her plucky cat yeah you know what i mean the like, jessica fletcher yeah yeah where f- this is like probably as close as i'll get to a cozy mystery yeah <laughs> so you know i don't know it there was just something very um uh endearing about this alien who gets involved in these mysteries basically because he's bored yeah <laughs> and you know he's just he like can't help himself yeah Because he's like, oh, I'm doing it again. (laughs) (laughs) So there's, I don't know, something sort of sitcom-y and fun about it. Yeah. And it's kind of episodic, too. Like the sort of, the government looking for him, they get closer and closer. Mm -hmm. But it's not like you have to read this all in one go or anything. Right. And it, you know, you can kind of space it out and it still works pretty well. Cool. I dropped your fancy pen. It's okay. Okay, I'm back. <laughs> That's Resident Alien. Okay, cool. All right, so I guess we should go through and talk about the other books that we brought. Yes. But more briefly, if we can manage it. I think so. Yeah. Okay, so I brought The Night Eaters by Marjorie Liu and Sana Takeda. And this is a horror graphic novel. It's pretty new, if not brand, brand new. I'm not sure when it came out, but this year. And there's this family that lives in this house in New York. And the mom is pretty brusque and unpleasant. And the dad is totally friendly and open and nice. Um, And they have this really kind of charming marriage that I don't know the fact that they're so opposite and understand each other so well is really kind of nice and charming and they have twin kiddos um, a boy and a girl and they are old enough that they've started their own business um, but they have moved back home because um, the pandemic has just started and everyone's struggling so they're living at home running their business and um, their mother has a real green thumb and has just gardened the ever-loving life out of their their yard. Uh-huh. <laughs> like It's just like it's a, a flourishing jungle. And across the street, there's this abandoned house, and it has just been taken over. There's like vines. It's your stereotypical like creepy abandoned house. Yep. And a friend of the family is a realtor and trying to sell it. And people are justifiably pretty not interested in even going inside. (laughs) (laughs) So um, he's complaining to the mom of this family one day about how, you know, he's going to lose his job if he can't get the commission on this house and 
all of that. And so she's, she's constantly smoking. She refuses to wear a mask. Uh, everyone else in the public at least is wearing masks and she refuses. And so she's kind of standing there kind of glaring at the house. And then she just marches across the street and starts looking around and goes inside. And, uh, there's this abandoned couch and like a rolled up rug with this dark spot on the floor and on the couch lined up are just like a dozen dolls. Oh God. Okay. Yeah. Just staring forward. Yep. At which point I would immediately nope out and just never pretend I'd never opened that door. Yeah. <laughs> but she walks in and she sits on the couch in between this, you know, the line of dolls. And so they're all just sitting there kind of staring forward. And it's like, this woman is different. And uh, then she gets up to go and, like, walk through the house a bit more. And in the next panel, it's a graphic novel. So in the next panel, all of the dolls' heads have turned and they're looking at each other. And they're like, this is horrifying. <sighs> yeah, no good. No. Uh, and she decides that she's going to, like, deal with all of the plants in this house and um, so that it can be sold and it won't be such an eyesore in their neighborhood. Sure. Um, but this house is not a nice house. <laughs> Yeah. Bad things have happened there. Yeah. As I think you can gather. Yep. So without getting into the whole thing, like that gives you an idea of what you're what you're in for if you choose to read it. I had a sort of obsession for a while with porcelain dolls. Oh, I remember. I was here for that. Yeah, it was like <laughs> so we were doing some weeding, getting rid of some really old books, and somehow I ended up with this collection, you know, it was like antique doll collection. Mm -hmm. And books. like character dolls. So they weren't uh, like your traditional smiling, curly haired, no. pretty dolls. They were so weird. So and then scary. The ways they were posed in the photographs was like bizarre. Yeah. Like, you know, there was like, I remember one and, and you know, it was like its leg was popped off and it was like holding its own leg. And yeah. They're all, they all have these like grimacing faces and stuff. Yeah. I, they were really strange there was one and she was like surrounded by dismembered dolls and crying yes and like, what is going on in these pictures there was another one that was getting out of a cradle it was like stepping out of a cradle and the cradle had a pentagram on it yeah. and i was like what is going on and then they had in the back they had pictures of like a you know turn of the century doll factory yeah and it th that was like the scariest thing i've <laughs> It looked like, you know, Civil War battlefield photos. Yeah. Like the guys, it was like these, you know, guys with mustaches, just like with dead eyes yep. looking into the camera while they're making <laughs> dolls. And it was like. Yeah, I'm it, sure that's all because, you know, you had to stay so still for photography yeah. at the time. But it comes across as just terrifying. The effect was just awful. Yeah. And I was like. This is the worst thing I've ever seen. Yeah. And like, so naturally you kept the book. Oh, I, I still have them. Yeah, yeah, I know. I still have two of them <laughs> at home because I just couldn't couldn't bear to get rid of them. Yeah, they are hidden treasures. They're... <laughs> yeah. It's Creepy just like, dolls. what were people thinking back dolls then? Dolls and clowns. Yeah, clowns are pretty, pretty creepy and as well. And then you've got clown dolls. Yeah, that's a whole nother level. <laughs> I just don't understand who like... How tastes have changed so much that, like, at that time, someone would see that doll and be like, yeah, that's something I'm going to put right next to where I sleep. Why? I guess if you're really into something, then anything that's different is interesting. Maybe. Yeah, they're like they're like movie critics who've seen too many movies. Yeah. And so then they just like some weird nonsense because they're like, at least it's different. Yeah. I guess that's possible. Yeah. <laughs> It makes sense as much as any possible theory of <laughs> dolls. Uh, so, yeah, that's The Night Eaters. Uh, and then we talked about Audienceology by Kevin Getz. We talked about Hyde by Kirsten White. Uh, and then my last book was Bird Planet by Tim Lehman. And this is another one of those books that's um, largely just really beautiful photographs. But there are essays in there and like anecdotes and stuff like that for anyone who's interested. So you can just look at all of the amazing photographs and he has them kind of separated out by region. So you get like Asian birds and South American birds and North American birds and, you know, all of the continents. Um, and you can just look at them. They really are stunning. Or you can also read the anecdotes about his travels and about his, you know, history and how he took the photographs and, um, why birds are important to the world and all of that stuff. 
Um, but mostly like the, the pictures, like if you have looked at, and we all have seen like the photographs out of National Geographic, like yeah, they're really, really beautiful. And so, you know, the fact that he has published a lot of his work in National Geographic should give you an idea of what you're looking at. But there's a lot of unpublished work in this um, stuff that, you know, he would go uh, intending to take photographs of a certain, you know, creature, or bird or whatever. And then he would take a picture that was gorgeous, but wasn't, didn't really fit into the story they were trying to tell. And so it would never get published. So that's where a lot of those kinds of things have ended up in this book. Hmm. Um, but it's just beautiful. The birds are kind of strange and wonderful anyway. They're colorful. And so the pictures in, in this are just really, really beautiful. Like nice. the, the bower birds that like do that weird dance. Oh, and there's yeah. some bird of paradise that dangles upside down to entice a mate. And, like, <laughs> so he's got pictures of lots of like Look bird what I could do. And <laughs> It's just really, it's really cool. Um, and, you know, birds are present on all of the continents and from like really high in the mountains to deserts. And so there are birds everywhere. And he's taken photographs of birds everywhere. Like, I can't imagine how much he's traveled doing nice. this work. That sounds delightful. Yeah, it's really cool. And he starts with, um, with Asian birds because I think he was... Um, born and grew up in Japan because his parents were missionaries. And so he talks about how that is part of why he has such a wanderlust is that, you know, he, he his parents wanted him to be comfortable as, as a citizen of the world. And so whenever they would go home to the United States to visit family, they would stop off in like Europe or they would, you know, take a vacation in India or, you know, whatever. And so he he had traveled a lot by the time he was old enough to just travel on his own it felt like nothing to like buy a ticket to a place he'd never been and travel there so okay this is a really dumb question okay it's never i've never really thought before about like uh asia having different birds than yeah. we have because i don't know why like i guess you know like it seems like we have the same dogs and like mice and stuff you know what i mean like <laughs> yeah but i guess birds they probably would have some different birds they do they huh. have some different birds like I'm trying to remember the name of this bird i should have brought the book with me because i could show you because there's this one bird that really stuck out to me like so like toucans if you think about yeah, like yeah. jungle birds yeah you know those are different and there's this one bird and it lives in like southeast asia somewhere and it has a beak that is traditionally beak shaped and large but it also has like this attachment on the top of it that like goes up their forehead and lo almost looks like a tusk and it's very colorful. It's, know, but it's weird looking, it's a weird looking bird. It would have been so bizarre to be like a, you know, an explorer back in the day. Yeah. And you would just, every animal you saw, you'd be like, what is that? Yeah. Why? What? Well, when you see like old illustrations of like elephants and stuff yeah you can tell that this is one of those things where somebody went to africa and saw an <laughs> elephant and was like whoa that's amazing and then they like went to like the middle east and told someone else about this amazing creature they'd seen called an elephant and then that person well, like went to europe and told someone else and then someone was like that's amazing and wrote a drawing of what they described and it looks nothing like an elephant yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, how weird would that be? Like, if you know, the pictures and stuff didn't really exist yeah. or whatever. So, like, you're like, I've never seen an elephant before, and then yeah. you're like, that's an elephant. <laughs> that would be so bizarre. Yeah, or like a giraffe. You'd be I like, love looking at old thing? illustrations of animals from like far off places that are done by you know traveling Europeans because it's always bananas. Like the yeah. what they've drawn is like that. That is not reality. <laughs> yeah, and I mean at least some animals, you know, like it seems like most places have their sort of at least sort of a version of a cow or something. Right. Where you're like, oh, this is a, a muskox. This is a wildebeest. Pretty whatever. -like. And you're like, hey, okay, yeah. <laughs> Looks kind of like an ox. This is a kind of a goat cow deer thing. 
But then you get into some of the, you know, like a hippo and you're like, yeah. I don't, a kangaroo? what do you even call that? Like a slippery bear? Yeah. I mean, what is this? Yeah. Yeah, a kangaroo? What is that? A platypus. People have probably didn't even believe that was real. I still kind of don't believe that's <laughs> real. Because why? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, birds are kind of like that. Some of them are just weird looking. Yeah, some of them are real weird looking. Yeah. I like their weird mating rituals, too. Yeah. Because I'm like, I guess that's impressive to a bird. Yeah. And, you know, it's so funny because as a human, you're just like, I have no frame of reference. You're like, so is that like a good? You're just like jerking your head around a yeah. lot and like flashing your left wing. Like, so that, that's like attractive. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and like for the birds, you know, the the bird is looking at these two birds doing that stuff, and it's like, oh, this one's obviously way yeah. better at it. Yeah. And as a human, I'm like, I can't even tell the difference. <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't even know what they're doing. Yeah. Well, I would recommend checking out Bird Planet and looking at some weird birds. All right. I'm into it. Yeah. Okay. I had, let's see. I talked about Rowley Jefferson's Awesome Friendly Spooky Stories by yeah. Jeff Kinney and Resident Alien uh, by Peter Hogan. I read uh, the Omnibus Version Volume 1, okay. which we have in print. Is that like the first three? I think, yeah, it's like yeah. the first three trade paperbacks mashed into one. Okay. It's not overly long. Okay. Um, then I didn't talk about The Day My Butt Went Psycho by Andy Griffiths. And I am sad about that. So a uh, a kid's butt, you know, it, the book starts and his butt has left his body and is like jumping out the window. Um, the butts are sort of described as all having like little twiggy arms and legs. <laughs> and uh, his... So does it leave just like a flat spot? Yes. Okay. Yeah. If your butt leaves, you have to get a uh, artificial butt put on <laughs> so that you can use the bathroom. Well, and sit. <laughs> yeah. Let's be honest. It's kind of described where he gets his fake butt, and then all of a sudden he has to use the bathroom. <laughs> um, and the fake butts are self-wiping, so that's good. Oh, that's convenient. So it follows this kid who his butt went psycho and is, like, leading a butt revolution. And the local butt catcher goes to try and, you know, quell this and doesn't realize he's walking into, like, a stadium full of butts. Oh. And then gets there and is, like, quickly overwhelmed. And the butts take his butt and put it where his face was and take his face and put it where his butt was. Uh-oh. Because the butts are like, we're tired of being at the bottom. We want to be on the top. And, you know. So he's a literal <laughs> butt face. Yeah. <laughs> so the plot of the book is this kid gets involved with a crew of butt fighters, as they're called. Which is like, so you've got your butt catcher. Right. That's your, like, first level of defense. Right. Then you've got your butt fighters right. who are like a more elite team of right for those rowdy butts that will not take it exactly yeah um so uh, the butt fighters consist of uh the smacker who is basically a lady who spanks butts <laughs> there's the kicker who kicks butts and there's the kisser who basically woos butts and you know, can convince them to do whatever. Yeah. Um, <laughs> She's like, oh, you're a nice butt. You don't want to do this. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is like the silliest thing I've ever read. Yeah. You know, and like every, everything about it, you know, they, they ride on butts for a while, you know, and the way they attract the butts that they can corral to ride on is they put out like a pink bath mat. And the butts are all attracted to it. And then they, you know, they <laughs> capture them in a net. I was going to ask you why. And then I was like, don't go there. Everything in the book is a butt, you know, like this is a butt gun. This is a butt mobile. This is like a butt, <laughs> a butt plane, you know, <laughs> like everything is a butt something. Um, they have to fight a giant butt. Um, oh, my gosh. I can't remember his name. You know, it's like Giganta Butt Gantor or something okay. like that. Uh, you know, and then they're, they're trying to get to, to quell this revolution of, you know, all the butts are like kind of getting out of control. Right. There's butt piranhas, there's poopisses, which is a porpoise, but a butt. <laughs> you know, all kind of, it's, it's nuts. Right. Um, yeah. If you had like a, a young relative who thinks that kind of thing is funny, which I think like 90% of them yeah. probably do. Yeah. I'm sure you find that one that one kid who's just like not into it. 
but they've got to be pretty few and far between. Yeah. Well, and I think that we all know, we all know those kids who tell the fart jokes. Like, yeah. that's, that's your audience. Yep. <laughs> uh, if you ever, you know, if you have a kid like that in your life, this is the perfect book for them. Their yeah. parents will probably kind of hate you for a little while. But at the same time, if they're, like, having a hard time getting this kid to read, yeah, I mean, this will get them to read. Yeah. Because... <laughs> it's what you got to do. Yeah. Go for the gross stuff. Go for the, like, silly stuff. Yeah. That'll get them. It's, it's pretty bizarre. And I've read a lot of very bizarre books. And this is, like, one of the more bizarre things. <laughs> like, the commitment, the level of commitment to... Someone doing this and kind of imagining the author sitting there writing this is hilarious. Yeah. I mean, you you seem to have genuinely enjoyed it. I, yeah, it's... You know what? At every turn, it goes for it. Yeah. There's never a point in the book where it, like, backs down from, you know, everything is about butts and farts and, yeah. you know, everything. It commits. It, it just goes further every chapter. <laughs> like, you think it's gone as far as it can because you're like, what else is there to do with butts? And it's like, oh, many more things. Don't you Don't worry. worry. Yeah. They've got <laughs> ideas. So highly recommend The Day My Butt Went Psycho by Andy Griffiths. All right. Uh, oh, and Your Pal Fred by Michael Rex. Okay, so this doll that's basically, like, meant to be a child's companion yeah. kind of wakes up. Um, but some kind of apocalypse has happened. And so there's, like, a big desert. There's, like, giant vehicles. Everybody kind of looks like Mad Max characters. Okay. Um, and there are these two sort of warring factions, you know, led by these two different guys. And so Fred uh, awakens and decides that he's just going to try to um, make these guys be friends again. You know, these warring things. Right. Or make them be friends, I guess. And so, you know, he's like journeying to the one guy's sort of kingdom to talk to him. And, um, you know, he makes some friends along the way. And then he goes to the other kingdom to talk to them. And it's kind of like... Fred is confusing to most people because he's just relentlessly positive. Like you can't, you can't bring him down. Yeah. And like when they try to punish him, it never works because he's just like, oh, thanks. You know, this is great. And like, it's really strange. And it's like a uh, kid appropriate sort of like Mad Max post-apocalyptic world, <laughs> which really shouldn't work, but kind of does. Yeah. You know, they have a big battle at the end between the two factions. And so I was like, well, how's this going to work? Like, you can't just have a guy decapitate someone with a giant pair of scissors and a Thunderdome in this kid's book. True. So they, you know. That seems like a bad idea. Yeah. So they just, like, launch slime at each other and stuff like that, you know. And Do they end up best friends? uh, I don't want to spoil the end. Uh Yeah, I know. You just have to read it. All right, fine. But it was it was actually really fun to read, and this is another one I would put in that category of like, if you got to read a book to your kids, mm. um, this is one that would be very tolerable for an adult. Okay, like you would probably enjoy it as an adult, and you would recognize those like tropes and stuff. Right. And, uh, I found it very amusing. Cool. All right, indulging your inner child this last month. I guess so. Yeah. Cool. I don't know something about it. I was just like, I'm gonna read read kids books i like it just sometimes every once in a while i get curious like what's out there i picked up up uh, sarah penny packer's middle grade novel um clementine Uh and loved it so much that i ended up reading the whole series yeah there's some really good kids books out there there are yeah yeah and it's like they just end up being kids books i guess because they're like easy to read and they're like appropriate for children the vocabulary and the sentence length and all of that is for kids but it doesn't mean that adults can't no. You can read that sentence length, too. Yeah. I know those words. Yeah, you can quite enjoy it, it turns out. Yeah. <laughs> and then some are not appropriate for any age when the day my butt went psycho, depending on your uh, values. But, you know, <laughs> whatever. There's a book for everyone. There but is. no book is for everyone. That's very true. Yeah. Yep. That's okay. Yeah. That's why there are so many. Yeah. Well, I'm glad Andy Griffiths did it. Yeah. Because I'm like, I don't know if you get a bunch of hate mail or whatever, but, like, I'm a fan. <laughs> Has he written other stuff? 
I know he's written three more or two more books. The Butt books are a trilogy. Oh, all right. And then uh, I think he has written a couple. Yeah, he has like a series about. It's called like the Treehouse with 130 floors or something. Okay. And some more like silly stuff. Seems like some wacky stuff. Cool. Yeah. Seems to be his beat. Nice. And so that's... if you do get this as a Christmas gift for somebody, you got more, more places to go. That's right. That's right. You could get more butt books. Yeah. You don't have to stop there. Yeah. Maybe too, if like. And then you can be the cool relative or the cool like. Yeah. Older person in their life. Like, yeah. They or, didn't I mean... get me, you know, tale of two cities. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or like if you had like a, a niece, let's say, and. The parents were like, oh, we're tired of her reading wimpy kid books all the time. Get her the day my butt went psycho. And then they'll be like, all right, maybe wimpy kid books are fine. (laughs) Maybe that's preferable. And the whole time she's becoming super literate. That's right. And she's going to do well in school and prove them all wrong. She'll have read all the greats. That's right. By the time. (laughs) Just goes to show you, hey, my generation grew up reading like, the Sweet Valley High books, and we're fine. Yeah, true. Yeah, I mean, I, I grew up reading nothing, so. Yeah. There you go. You did come to books later in your life. I did, yeah. I was probably like 22. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty late. It's never too late, though. No, it turns out it's okay. You can okay. always become a reader. You can. You can. Yep. And you can always go back and hit the stuff you missed yeah. <laughs> about butts and what they yeah. go. <laughs> Haunted houses that turns out are just haunted houses, and then we're just going to live with it. <laughs> porcelain dolls. There's yeah. a, a treasury out there of <laughs> horrifying books about porcelain dolls. <sighs> just waiting for you to find them. Yep. Yep. All right. Well, on that note, I yeah. think we, we got through another one. Okay. We did it. Go us. Well, we'll see you next time. Yeah. Thanks I... for joining us. And yeah. next time we will have something special. Yeah, we're either going to do a top 10 from the year or, like, top gift books yeah. to give other people. We haven't decided if we're going to do our year's best books in January or December. So yeah. The, if you have an opinion, feel free to get in touch. Yeah, if you'd prefer one or the other. Because <laughs> probably if one person has an opinion that they express yeah. somewhere online, uh, you'll probably sway the vote. So it's true. You rock the vote. It's true. So, yeah, go to our Instagram, and Peter usually puts something on our Instagram about the podcast. So just find that post and put your opinion there, and he'll definitely see it. Yeah. Done. Yeah. All right. Cool. We'll see you next time. All right, and on that note, happy reading, everybody. Yeah, happy reading. Bye. Bye.